Great. <laughs> Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining. Uh, we are now live. We are global. And I'm very glad that uh, this week, uh, this Sunday, we have Professor uh, Zevik Galil. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I think he can pronounce better than me. We are talking about uh, lots of exciting issues about, I mean, his great uh, research, administration, online courses, among uh, other stuff. Uh, thus, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Devi. Uh, he has been actually, I mean, like in terms of administration, he's like probably a perfect example of a person who has done a great administration in several levels at the especially in academy at chair level, dean, which is one level higher, and then president of the universities, top universities. Uh, he is actually a member of National Academy of Engineering and also uh, a fellow of uh, American uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences and fellow of ACM as well. Uh, so this is just a brief uh, things. He will talk more about himself and we will talk more about, uh, I mean, his great achievements and experiences and like uh, you know, somehow uh, a good uh, results that we all can use out of his great experiences. Uh, great, so I think uh, with this introduction, uh, and I want to actually say, uh, first I uh, met uh, uh, Devi in was, I think around 2020, uh, yeah, that was that time that was a Blavitnik award party. It was a very high profile party actually. At, and uh, Levy was one of the people who was there and actually he was one of the people in the selection committee. That was the first time that I met uh, Levy and it was great. And then we recently met again at uh, University of Maryland. He came uh, to give a talk and we had a dinner. And I think uh, it is now a good time to have him for a more detailed discussion. Uh, with this uh, start, uh, I think, uh, do you want to uh, start, say some initial words, and then we can go ask questions and discuss more? Oh, it's a pleasure to sit down and discuss with you. Uh, I'm looking forward for the questions. I prepared a couple of things uh, that I may or may not add, and I'm looking forward uh, to get some questions. Uh, yeah, uh, that's great. And sorry, sometimes I will look at it in my uh, cell phone because I want to check. I'm running the system behind it. I want to make sure everything is going fine. And if there are, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, uh, especially at uh, YouTube Live or at LinkedIn. These are the best places to ask questions. We will be happy to see questions and answer them. But we are live also at Twitter and Facebook as well. Uh, great. So I think uh, let's go with the start with the personal life. So when did you born? I mean, uh, tell us a little bit about your family. I mean, uh, I know that you have been a marathon runner. You can tell about those and even the last time that you actually participated in the in any marathon. And I mean, the hobbies, etc. And then we will go to more serious questions. Okay. Uh, I was born it was in what was called uh, mandatory Palestine. And I was born uh, 10 and a half months before Israel. Uh, my father was a professor, professor of botany. And I grew up in Israel. Uh, I have a wife uh, of 52 years, the same wife. And... Uh, uh, we have a son, uh, uh, he went to Colombia when he was 14 years old. And at the age of 18, he was class salutatorian. That means number two of 1200 students. And he gave the speech together with the valedictorian and Robert Rubin, who was a secretary of the treasury. Uh, he, he's married to a neurosurgeon and they have three incredible, lovable, and loving uh, children, our grandchildren. Um, 
so this is more or less a, you, you mentioned marathon. A, a, I, my first marathon was, was when I was 42. I ran seven official marathons, a, but 20 more in, in training a, until I tore my meniscus. So I stopped, uh, I stopped running in 1997. So the first one, uh, 1995 was my last marathon. That's, that's one of the things where I didn't reach my goal. My goal was to beat three, three hours and 30, and I, I got three, three hours and 39. Probably okay. <laughs> if started earlier, I, I would be able to break the, the 330. But you started at 42. That's, I think, great. Um, you know, it's like maybe I'm, I'm actually 43 now, but... Better, you know, better like, late than never. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's uh, great. And I think uh, you mentioned also that uh, your whole family actually have been almost professors. So can you tell about your dad? What did they study? Oh, okay. I didn't tell my, my wife. I screwed my wife by mistake. So first of all, my father was a professor. I, I, I am a professor. My wife was a professor. Uh, she is a, a leading uh, bio marine biologist in a very important area, which is called a marine invasive species. Uh, it's very important, for example, in the Great Lakes, zebra mussel invaded and, and caused uh, billions of dollars of damage because they destroy most of the fishery in the Great Lakes. So, so that's a very important area, and she's one of the leading scientists in this area. And as a result, that all of us were professors, uh, our son was not attracted, attracted uh, to, to be a professor. He is a corporate lawyer. His wife is neurosurgeon. Uh, great. So uh, and uh, when did uh, so uh, uh, your father was a professor? Did he do it in math or computer science? No, no, no. Actually, he he was very good in math, but at that time when he applied to university, the spirit of the epoch was to do agriculture because people created kibbutzim and and this he wanted to do agriculture. Agriculture was not in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Agriculture was not available, so he studied the uh, botany. And he was a professor of botany, a world-class professor. He was one of the six founders of Tel Aviv University in 1953. Yeah, great. Actually, that is interesting. Like when <laughs> back in Iran, I think that was the, uh, so when I was a child, that was like, there were some of like apples or walnuts. I remember that they call it actually Israeli <laughs> apples or Israeli, Israeli walnuts, and they had they were actually known very good ones. Like I, my dad actually bought one and uh, he planted actually one a tree himself. So that's an interesting thing. I, I, now I understand. I mean, why that was like especially uh, this area was hot in. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there, uh, great. So, uh, so when, so how did you like? I think now talking a little bit about your career. How did you decide that you want to go to math, computer science, and was there a computer science even at that time? No, or no, no. More no. Math, I, I, I'm, I'm too old. Uh, so I'll tell you the story. I, I was strong. I was strong in math uh, in high school, in college, and I, I studied applied math. So uh, I studied applied math uh, in college uh, and in the undergraduate studies. And also I continued the master, master degree uh, with, uh, in uh, game theory, which was part of math. My, my advisor was Robert Aumann. I'm not sure you heard the name, but 34 years after he was my advisor, he won the Nobel Prize in economics. Okay. Um, and then uh, I, start, I decided I didn't want to do really math, applied math maybe, but then computer science started. Computer science was the new kid on the block. And the, the, it has an attraction, it still does, as a new field. You know, the, in mathematics, there are problems that people have been working on, on them for hundreds of years. <laughs> it's, not the true, it's not true for computer science. So, so the field there was quite open and, uh, and that was attractive. So I, uh, 
I decided to study computer science and to apply to Cornell. So I applied, it's a long story. I applied and accepted uh, to Cornell where I did my PhD. And was it in applied math or in computer no, no, science? No, 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 in computer science. Okay, so at that so time Cornell they had already, computer already, it was 1972, had the computer science department for, for about seven years. Uh, who was the head? Cornell. Yeah. Oh, Cornell they had, had the computer science for seven years. departments. It was one of the first computer science departments in the US or in the world. Uh, great. Uh, so then I think you want to talk about your advisor <laughs> that like, and a little bit about the, uh, I mean, your thesis, how was the relation with your advisor? We will come back later, ask you how was your relation with your students as well. Actually, you can, if you want, you can also mention no, that. No, as but well. uh, students will get to it later because yeah, like, that's, that's too early. Uh, at this yeah. stage, I didn't have students. Uh, <laughs> My advisor was John Hopcock. The reason I, want, I went to John uh, was that I knew, I, I sat in the course of formal languages. I, I, I went to computer science with very little uh, uh, background in computer science. I knew to program in, in Fortran. And I'm not sure you remember the bad old days when we did uh, programming with punch card. Uh, when, uh, when, when a, a 10 line program would take you one week. Why? Because you wrote the program and then you handed it to some, to some women that punched the cards. You got it the next day. Then you, then you brought the box with the cards uh, to some people that ran the, pro, the, ran the cards and then the next morning you got syntax error. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it, took, it took a week or it's sometimes more to do a 10 line program. So these were the days. And so uh, when, did, when did you go to uh, PhD? What time did, that you started your PhD? In 1972. Okay, seven years after I ha I was born. <laughs> so that, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I I heard about it actually. I read some books that mentioned that, but I never. I mean, of course, don't mistake. So I so I, I, so, I, I so I had no background in computer science and. The, the story of how I got into Cornell, it's, it, we won't tell it today, but I, I'll, I'll give you a reference if you want to hear it uh, in a minute. Uh, so I sat in two courses. One of them was Formal Languages by Amir Pnueli, uh, because I started working with Amir Pnueli, uh, that 24 years later he got the Turing Award. Uh, and the, he taught formal languages and used the book of Hopcroft and Alman. So the only name at Cornell when I came to Cornell was Hopcroft and I came to Hopcroft and I told her, and Hopcroft asked me, what do you want to do? And, and I said, formal languages. And he gave me the best advice in my life. He said, formal languages are dead. <laughs> and uh, in fact, in Europe, they might still be doing formal languages. They are still doing that, story. sure. <laughs> that's another story. So. Yeah. Uh, so he became uh, my advisor, uh, but I was intimidated by him. I, he was, you know, accessible. Whenever I wanted to see him, I saw him, but he was so fast. People think I'm fast. People tell me, it's V, you're very fast. I tell them, you ain't seen nothing yet. He was fast, he understood me immediately, he talked fast. And then I went to the cubicle, you remember there were cubicles once, uh, and sat there and for an hour tried to understand what he told me. I got more confidence uh, after a couple of times when I saw that he was wrong. He made yeah. mistakes, <laughs> he, he was human. Uh, so he was my advisor, I was intimidated, it was mostly my fault, you know, uh, because I was, as many PhD students, I wasn't sure I can do it. You know, being a good or excellent student in mathematics uh, is one thing. Being creative and finding and proving things that nobody has ever done before, it's daunting, it's scary. And I didn't have this confidence. But then <laughs> on the side of it, Yuri Satmanis, who is the father of complexity, who, who founded the computer science department at Cornell, he liked me because I took, I took his course and he, he became a mentor. And actually, in November, I was in a conference in memory of Yuri Satmanis. Uh, I gave a talk. We said, Yuri is my super mentor and, su and super supporter. And if you want 
to hear it, uh, we will put the link uh, uh, afterwards uh, in, the, in this website. Uh, so he was my mentor and he kept me alive. You know, he, he gave me support, he encouraged me. Uh, uh, something I got less from John. Uh, great. Yeah, I think the one important point that you have mentioned, it is very important, that I heard actually um, from several of my students, they are, I mean, great essentially. They have been like, say, in math Olympiad or even computer Olympiad, but their research is a bit scary. When I mention, okay, this problem has been open for 30 years, 40 years. I mean, there are now, I think nowadays they're like this, even I think that almost we are, I mean, not still 100 years for P versus NP, but like that's probably the... Uh, so you asked yeah. me about my thesis. My thesis was about the complexity of the resolution, and uh, uh, which I didn't solve. It was solved 15 years later. You know, all the proof systems, they are polynomial if NP is closed under complement. That's another op big open problem. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so basically, this, the, this conjecture that it's not closed under complement that they, all of them have to be exponential. And indeed, resolution was proven to be exponential uh, 15 years later. Yeah, uh, so do you want to I say prove, what is the resolution? Uh, I'll explain. Uh, yeah. Resolution is a way to prove uh, uh, satisfiability with, with, with clauses, with uh, creating trees. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to get to the technicality of this. Yeah, just uh, a high level, I think that should case be. case of resolution called regular resolution which is, looks like more natural, and this I proved it, it was exponential. So that was, that was a problem uh, Hopcroft gave me, a problem we worked on it, and it was not successful, and, and, and I solved it. And that was my thesis. But, uh, but I, I didn't, after my thesis, I didn't go there anymore. So it's not that I, that I continue working. I mostly went in the direction of algorithms, except that I worked in several other fields. Uh, great. So uh, uh, I think uh, that's the, um, I think we co uh, covered essentially about it. Oh, uh, one question, important things. So uh, how much did you work there? How much you are working now? You have been all these other different administrative work. I mean, uh, I, I know that I mean, we actually talked a lot yesterday. So and we were working, we were almost midnight, we were sending emails, but I want to hear from you. Uh, so I have, uh, I can divide my life to, to four periods. First is the childhood and the, and the early studies, you know, high school and, and college. Then graduate studies and be, before and BA, before administration. Chairman, I don't count. So during the time I was a graduate student or I was a faculty, I did lots of research. Uh, also, when I was chair, it was helpful that at that time I already had students because the more administration you do, the less you can do uh, research. When I was dean, very little research, very little. A paper here and there, uh, it's, it's, in, it's almost impossible because you have to devote all of, you, all of yourself to, to the position of the dean. You, you don't have time. And, and for research, to do really research, you have to devote all of yourself to research. So you have, you have only one you. So uh, you cannot do both as dean and as a researcher. And, and I did very little, and even now I do very little, very, very little research. Also the field has moved a lot. Uh, but uh, how many hours in terms of hours? I am a working machine. That's the only thing I know. The only thing I know is, is to work. So I cannot put a number because I sometimes sleep and I sometimes read and sometimes some entertainment, but, but usually a big, big part of the day is work, including in the middle of the night when I wake up. Yeah. If I don't I sleep I well, I can work. Uh, so uh, when I did research, uh, eight hours on research was normal. And of course, you do exercise, as you mentioned, for marathon, etc. Because I think that's also one important part that we need to keep our body working, so that we can do more research. Um, uh, great. So uh, I think uh, let's uh, go after PhD. So you got your PhD from Cornell, and 
now you want to talk a little bit more about your career. And I think here we are going more also toward the administrative work that you have done it. And I think we want to get uh, essentially good experience that you had it and anything that can be useful for any future leaders. Uh, good. So do you want to say after your PhD, you got your PhD, did you apply for a job? What did happen? Yeah. So uh, I was lucky in my life. Almost never I have applied for a job. The only time I applied for a job is at this stage uh, for a postdoc. Postdoc. And I went to Yorktown Heights uh, for a year uh, at Yorktown Heights. Uh, and then I uh, went to Tel Aviv University because it was kind of understood that I will go back to Tel Aviv University. And then I was faculty at Tel Aviv University in full uh, six years. Uh, in the last three, I was chairman, but don't get impressed. I was chairman of the fledgling computer science department. I had three faculty. <laughs> okay, yeah. So it was a department or even sub-department uh, inside a department of mathematics, inside of the School of Science. Okay. The, and the, my main achievement there, uh, um, the two hires. Uh, one was Boris Trachtenbrot, uh, which actually was more famous than anybody, including Amir Pnoeli, uh, who, uh, who was there, uh, because all of us were very young. Uh, Amir Pnoeli was 31. Uh, uh, and the second one is Micha Sharir. Micha Sharir, who is the king of computational geometry now. Uh, yeah. In the Conference of Computational Geometry, I think he had more than 100 papers, and the second has 20. So he is the king of computational geometry. Uh, Micha actually studied with me uh, undergraduate uh, uh, at Tel Aviv University. But he was three years younger, because he went immediately after high school, and I went after army. And I think you mentioned actually Noga Allen that we also... <laughs> and Noga Allen in 90... I kind of, you know, I always take all the credit for everything. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I claim that I discovered Noga. Noga might watch it and may not agree. He, he was a PhD student uh, in mathematics. And he took my course on, of advanced algorithm in 1980 when I was chair. The Japanese Academy of Science invited me to Japan for three years. For three months, I'm sorry, for three months. And the first month was in, in the academic year. So I asked Noga, who, who was a PhD student in mathematics, who took my course to teach the rest of the class. And he did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> because I, I immediately <laughs> saw that this guy will be a star. <laughs> and, uh, and he is. Yeah, and he is, yeah. Actually, we had a great um, talk with him <laughs> earlier in this series. <clears throat> uh, great. So uh, then you went there. So uh, was there like assistant professor, associate professor at that time there? Uh, as well, or? Yeah, yeah. But in, in Israel, it's lecturer, senior lecture. It's like the British system. Yeah, the British system. Senior, yes, exactly. senior lecturer, associate professor, and full professor. And full professor. Uh, I actually, my thesis I did in two years and eight months. I became, I, I joined as a, as a senior lecturer already and was full professor in five years. Okay, that's great. Uh, this, uh, nowadays, uh, neither is possible, but uh, in, in the good old days, uh, when ha computer science hardly existed, you could do things faster, though it was also fast, fast for that time. Uh, great. Then uh, you joined Colombia in 1982. I mean, why did you move from Israel to Colombia? Uh, so I, after six years, uh, I had a sabbatical. The sabbatical lasted 25 years. <laughs> so I was first a year sabbatical, then, uh, then another uh, year without pay, two, two of those. And after three years, I arranged and I had an arrangement, which I think I'm the second in the world that, that had such arrangement. The first of them was Michael Rabin, who by the way is 92 now, but I uh, haven't seen him for, uh, for a while, uh, which was joint position. I was in, Tel in Colombia and in Tel Aviv. So after three years I was at Colombia, 
From 85, I was a fall in Colombia, spring in Tel Aviv. But in 89, I became chair uh, uh, at Columbia, and I, I took a leave from Tel Aviv. I but see. when I became dean five years later, I couldn't be dean and also professor somewhere else. So, so in, in 95, I stopped the, this arrangement because, you know, you cannot be dean or president and be in two places, you know, you need full attention. Yeah, uh, I know like uh, Shafiq Goldwasser had the same thing with MIT and Wiseman, I think the same type of thing. Uh, not exactly, I'm not, exactly not sure about the details. Yeah, Wiseman we, never allowed it. It's Hebrew that, University yeah. first and then Tel Aviv University, they're not happy, but they, when they don't have a choice, they allow it. Yeah. So she managed to do it, but maybe not completely officially. I don't know, I have to ask her. Good. Well, uh, I think uh, this is the question that uh, now we want to talk more about the uh, career. So you have done lots of administration. So we want to somehow try to summarize I mean, for the next leader. I think the one question is that, should I be, uh, I mean, should I promote my career to be a leader or not? That's one question. And uh, so we will go there. I think you can answer uh, when you answer other questions. Uh, but uh, like you decide, I mean, whether this thing that you became the chair, I mean, that happened, for example, at Tel Aviv University, but later at Columbia, I assume there were more people when you became the chair. So what was the way of thinking that you wanted to be a leader or people essentially put you on that position? So I, I never, and then how did you go up? Essentially? When I went to university, I never planned on leadership, okay? And um, I don't think this exactly are things that are planned. And sometimes you start with something small and you discover they are pretty good in it. So that's how you grow, okay? So I was chair of Tel Aviv for three people. Then I was chairman of SIGACT. SIGACT is a special interest group of uh, algorithm and computational complexity theory. Uh, it's the ACM organization of all the theoreticians. And I was yeah. there for two terms, for two, two terms of two years. Uh, and my main achievement there was I saved SIGAC. People now don't know. Uh, SIGAC was in deep financial trouble. And later they, they solved it in, in, in a smarter way. I wasn't that smart. So, and the smart way is to get royalties on all the proceedings. They didn't have this idea, okay? So uh, ACM or IEEE, they got the money. Uh, I introduced corporate affiliates, IBM, at and each of them paid a small amount, and right away, Sigat was in the black. Sigat was going to collapse financially. I, I, I said, uh, by the way, my deputy, my second in command was David Johnson. David was the secretary treasury for secretary treasurer for the two terms, and he was my successor after afterwards for two. And and I, we worked very closely together. Yeah, and I think he was actually my boss at AT and I always say that he was the greatest boss that I ever had. Unfortunately, he passed away. I mean, five six years ago uh, due to some complications of some surgeries and uh, et cetera. Uh, good. So I think uh, then, uh, so this SIGAC chair was before your Columbia uh, chair? No, no, I, well, I was at Columbia at that time, but, but it was before I was chair at Columbia. I, chair was, at Columbia. I was, uh, Then they asked me to be chair. <laughs> uh, and from 89 to 95, I was chairman of the department. Uh, and I actually, I, I, my main achievement was to bring peace. Uh, we had, the, we had the, the founding chair, there was a revolt, there was a war in the department. If you are in academia, a war in academia, you know, no bloodshed, but it's very unpleasant, very, very ugly, can be, be very ugly. And I was not in, either of the camps. I wanted the chair to continue, but, but the, the rebels had legit claims. Uh, and the chair was smart enough and stepped down and I was full professor. The other ones were very young. So 
I, I was more senior than everybody else except the chair and except some two people that came from EE and, uh, and MAS that, that, you know, they, they were not exactly computer scientists. So they asked me to be chair. And, and I was chair and I restored the peace. Plus, uh, I, the department had some financial pressures, uh, which I, I also uh, helped fix because I'm very tight-fisted. Uh, I'm very frugal and can do lots of things with, without a major spending. So I, uh, I brought uh, the department to financial security. Uh, great. Yeah, so this piece you mentioned is actually the important one. Like I have been here at the University of Maryland for 10, 10 years. Unfortunately, the past two years, there are these issues that they are mentioning. And we had like at the department level and the like a college level, unfortunately. And we will uh, talk a little bit more about them. So uh, good. So uh, like, uh, I think it, it might be a good, uh, I mean, things for the audience to know. So what are the responsibility of the chair, dean, provost, and president? Because you have been almost in all, in all three, four of them. So can you explain a little bit, I think, in general, what would be the, I mean, maybe briefly, the responsibility of each of them, and then we can go from there. Each of them is the leader of a unit, okay? And the leader of the unit has uh, several roles. Uh, the, the, the automatic one is representing the units, you know. So the chair represented to the dean or to, to outside world. And, and in this, most, most chairs and deans and presidents do a pretty good job, you know, to go to parties, uh, uh, to speak a little bit about the department or the school or the university. And that's pretty good. Uh, the second uh, part is in departments less. Departments usually don't do fundraising. But dean and presidents do fundraising, which is very important. Because usually the resources available for the unit are insufficient, especially if you want to do something new. Uh, uh, and you have to raise them. So some, some people, uh, some, sometimes through grants, uh, but sometimes through do donations. Uh, and I developed to be a pretty good uh, fundraiser because I'm a pretty good beggar. You know, you need to beg. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you need, however, to give a reason for the begging. So I, uh, I was quite, as I'll indicate a bit later maybe, uh, I was quite successful. The third part, and these uh, people vary, okay? So there are some things better than others, okay? Uh, but all of them do probably a, a decent job, okay? Because they represent the school or the university. They have the alumni that love the university, want to help it. They have to give them reason. They usually have some good stuff to, to support the fundraising. So, so they usually fundraise a, a decent amount and not always a huge one. A, the third one, which is the hardest, <laughs> is being a leader and taking the unit in new directions. So, uh, and that was uh, what I mean. I managed to do it. Not everybody, even not the president managed to do it. Uh, I can tell you what I've done as a Dean at Columbia. I was 12 years as Dean from 95 to 2007. Uh, I was president of Tel Aviv University for two years only because I was pushed out. I'll get to it in a second. Yeah. And I was a dean at, at uh, Georgia Tech where, where I was dean uh, for nine years. And there I did the biggest thing in my life. So, uh, which dwarfs my research. Okay. Uh, so, I so I can tell you uh, the achievement in, in each of these three units, if you wish. Yeah, so uh, let me actually start with this thing. So there was a book uh, that I actually saw about, uh, I mean, the history of a uh, school of engineering and applied sciences at Columbia. I'm sure there are similar things for Georgia Tech and other <laughs> places that you have been there. And in that book, uh, I think uh, Peter uh, Likings, uh, who, is, who later became president of Arizona uh, University for nine years, he mentioned that's actually quite, I mean, shocking to me to read this one and like shows your achievements that in uh, 12 years of uh, uh, Galilee leadership, 
probably that he actually said ranks as the most successful in the school in the 143 year history of it. And then mentioned maybe there are some others which are close to him in that sense. So that's quite a bit of achievement. And I so like, to Likens was Likens was also a dean, a pre predecessor of my predecessor. He was he was very good, but he was uh, only four years. So yeah. so he and my, my achievement as, as a dean at Columbia uh, was one. Uh, I raised uh, uh, $27 million to name the school. At that time, you won't believe it because now some university gets hundreds of millions of dollars as a gift. This $27 million in 1997 was the biggest gift in the history of Colombia. Yeah. I think uh, you may want to go just, uh, yeah. But of course, it's not biggest now, but it might be, I don't, I'm not sure, still the biggest for engineering. So that was one, one major achievement, plus the, again, financials. When I got to school as dean, it was broke. I, I actually uh, brought it to uh, almost prosperity. So uh, we, we, because, because A, I, I'm very good with money. I, I consider the school money as my money. Uh, I'm frugal, I try to do more with less. And, uh, and usually I came to units that that wasn't the case, that people simply spent. <clears throat> and I, so, uh, great. So I think that was another thing that was like reading in that book that I mentioned, they said that, I mean, when you wanted to leave actually Colombia, students were thinking that was that way, that you should not leave Colombia. So that's another exciting thing. I always say that, I mean, if you are a good chair, if you are a good dean or a good president, that actually when I was at... Uh, MIT, I have noticed that, uh, I mean, the, like the a previous president, he became actually returned as a faculty and essentially the same university and continued his research and so on. So I think that's important that like, if you are a good, uh, like in general, if someone is a good chair, dean or president can come back to that unit and continue the, I mean, the rest of his life, like as a researcher or the, faculty, regular faculty member. So uh, like if you want to say like, uh, let's say three or four, I mean, like any number of good, I mean, and bad properties that you think a dean and the maybe I mean, I would say dean or the chair, you can say separately, that they should have it to be successful. What are these? And like, you can say also the bad things that, I mean, somebody should not have it essentially. I'm not sure it's four, but a, the person should have people skills, okay? It should have what? People skills. People, people skills. Uh, you know how to deal with people, how to interact with them. He should have some humility, you know, not uh, uh, some chairs so deans, it gets into their head. So, and actually understand uh, that the faculty is the most important part of the university. And I'll get, I'll tell you a story in a minute to, uh, about it. Yeah. Uh, and he should be good with budgets. You know, the larger the unit, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, when, I, when I started this dean at Columbia, uh, the, the school had a small number of millions of dollars deficit. Or, or, uh, and when I finished, uh, they were left with $38 million. So uh, because of good, good money, money and good management. But I, I'm in the opinion uh, that the faculty are the university. And I'll tell you a story. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, everybody knows uh, about Dwight and the Eisenhower. Everybody knows he was the uh, president of the United States for two terms in the 50s. Everybody knows that he was the leader of the American and the Allies forces in Second World War. But very few know that in between, he was parked at Colombia. He was the president of Colombia. And one day he came to talk to the Senate, to the faculty. And he told them, you, the faculty, are the employees of the university. So a little guy, a bit older, raised his hand. This guy was I.I. Rabi. 
Nobel laureate in physics. And he said, Mr. President, we the faculty are not employees of the university. We are the university. We are the and I believe in it. And that's why you have to treat faculty, of course, faculty are all, all types and shapes. There are some nudges, there are some bad ones. You know, you have to be careful. However, many of them are really good and you cannot do anything without them. If you want, you know, like with the online program, the way I did it, I first got the faculty to agree to do it. Yeah, I think we will go there. So there was one question actually from the audience that is really interesting. So uh, like, if you want to, like if you are a dean, if you want to, for example, select a chair, uh, are you doing it by selection committee or you yes, appoint yes, always, it? always, 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 no, always selection. By the always unit. selection. By the, think... Always by the unit. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it depends. Uh, sometimes uh, the committee brings two or three candidates and you select them. You will select uh, them. But they, they can give you their preferences and usually uh, you respect them. You see, you as dean uh, is one thing, but they, they probably studied the candidates much more thoroughly than you, you can. So they, exactly. they can give you very valuable input. Of course, you have other reasons and you need a very good chemistry with the candidate as dean and a chair. And sometimes you see some sites that they don't see. And you take the second, not the first, but but usually uh, I, I I followed the, the choice of the- Yeah, uh, I always say actually, I mean, appointing like a chair or generally a person below you, especially in the academic world. I mean, without getting the, imp I mean, without getting like selection committee, et cetera, it's just too liability for the dean. Because if something bad goes there, everyone points to you essentially. You uh, are this so there. it's good also in terms of CYA. I'm not sure you know, cover your whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, I think that's exactly the thing. So if something bad, I mean, that's the unit essentially selected that person. So if there was also another actually chair mentioned this one. I want to see, do you believe in it? So is academia is a democratic place or not? I think, uh, what do you mean? Is the United States democracy? Uh, okay. yeah. there, there is no perfect democracy. There, there is no perfect democracy, uh, but it's close. Yeah, uh, uh, I think it's close, uh, though uh, certain people at a certain level have more authority and they can override others. But that's true also in normal democracy. So uh, it should be as democratic as possible. Yeah, I think probably two important part of it would be, I mean, like transparency and shade, uh, like shared governance. I think these yeah. are like some... No, 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 they, they, that's important. That's important. Uh, basically, you know, Many of the faculty have tenure. You cannot give them orders. You cannot tell them to jump. They will laugh you out of the room. Uh, you want them to want to do it, okay? So, so basically, so even though the idea of the online program was not from the faculty, but I created a process to bring them in and to make them believe that it was their idea. And, and that's the best thing to do so, so they can, because you then depend on their execution, you know? So uh, it has to be, uh, they have to be full partners. Yeah, I think that's a very important part, I think that you mentioned. But this is probably different between like the, in like companies versus academia. This yes, is, yes, I think, yes. uh, I, I think you, that was the thing that you, you can talk more about it. You believe that actually being a faculty, um, having a faculty position is one of the best places, best position that you can have. And I think one good thing that comes with it is the concept of tenure, at least. In the US or probably several other places as well, that when you got you get your tenure, they cannot kick you out. But there are some reasons that they can, I mean, do it some, I mean, that there are some about. abuses. Uh, there are some uh, cases, but the, uh, the general case is not like that. But, yeah. but there are cases people abuse uh, the system. Yeah, so I have, I mean, lots of companies, and of course, in the companies, everyone listens to the person above because that person can fire you next time, next day, essentially, and happens, for example, at Microsoft Research or others, essentially. But university, this cannot happen, and I think this is the thing that, like, if you are a dean, actually, you will be the person that after several years, you will be gone. If I'm a faculty, I will be still there if I have my tenure. 
So in some sense, you are in some kind of temporary position, not me. And I think probably that's the reason that also, I mean, uh, the person that you mentioned actually, the, uh, he also mentioned that we are the, actually the university because we are there and you are there essentially for some temporary time. And this kind of like shared uh, governance, transparency, these are like very important things that, again, I appreciated actually much more in the this past two, three years that we had some several issues in that regard. Uh, great. Okay, so now let's go uh, after that to online courses. This is like, the, I can tell you also about, I think maybe you have uh, not seen the reaction of other people. So when you, I think you start this concept of online courses, there are several companies now based on that uh, things. There are Coursera, Udacity, and Udemy. That's, these are like three major ones that I know. No, no, edX, edX. E edX as well. Coursera, Udacity, they were the first ones. And edX uh, was a few months later. Uh, yeah. edX is Harvard and MIT. Uh, yes. Udacity, uh, uh, Coursera and Udacity are private companies now. Yeah, I think Udemy is another one I checked actually. That's another one that I'm uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not familiar these with These are like, the, actually it's a public company even. Uh, good. So uh, now these are the companies and I can tell you like back in 2013, that was the start of that time. So uh, this Georgia Tech was very good example of that. And of course at that time you were the dean and you will tell us more about uh, this. That at that time we were in some faculty meetings and oh, we, uh, Actually, Georgia Tech has started such a big uh, uh, online courses, especially for master in computer science. It was a huge thing. It was everywhere. I don't know, hundred uh, articles maybe on that in the uh, like the, on the front uh, cover of New York Times and other places. And at that time, actually, we were worried because uh, we said, okay, maybe is it the case that if there is online courses, then maybe I mean, then uh, it would be only a few universities. Maybe we will lose our job because we don't need that many faculty. One person can teach everyone. I mean, like one good person can teach essentially lots of students. Although we don't need to have several students, uh, faculty to teach, for example, algorithms at the same uh, semester. And so that was the idea at that time. Uh, we had a faculty, he mentioned like, hey, don't worry. Books had the same things essentially. The people could do the, read the books and learn about it, but we are still have the job. And so almost 13 years after that time, still we have our job. Okay, so tell us about this successful program that you have created at Georgia Tech. What was the idea? Why did you decide to do that actually? It was a very huge one. That's also maybe some people start with a smaller one, but you decided to go very big. No, no, no. It and, became big only later. Uh, I'll, I'll okay. So, so then, uh, that we started relatively small. Uh, okay. So, so what was the so motivation? First, so how did you so decide first, to do I, that? Uh, so, so I'll tell you the history. Okay. okay. And the prehistory is the MOOCs. Uh, in around 2012, actually, late in 2012, uh, there was the first MOOC. MOOC is Massive Open Online Course. It, it's courses, uh, it, not for credit, you know, but a full course like in university. The first course was done by Sebastian Tran and Peter Novi, both of them uh, in Stanford and in Google. But they, almost at the same time, Daphna Collier did the one and uh, Andrew Eng did one. Yes. Uh, then in the beginning of 2000, and that was end of 2011, in, in the beginning of 2012, uh, Sebastian created Udacity and Daphna and Andrew created Coursera. Yes. Later, uh, Anant Angawal at MIT, who didn't teach in MOOCs before, uh, created edX. And they had MOOCs and everybody, and they were uh, the big cry, you know, the new thing. Except they were not for credit. Later on, they introduce certificates. But what do you do with certificates? Certificate that you take, they took a course in data structures. Well, what does it mean? You can hang it in the bathroom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and Sebastian uh, came to me in September of 2013 and said, Tzvi, that's how you pronounce it, Tzvi, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, it's tough. Americans, not only you, everybody struggles with it. Yeah. Uh, it's the, let's do a full degree based on MOOCs. And let's 
Mooks were free, let's charge a thousand dollars because the idea is everything is free, but now a thousand. I'm, as I, as I indicated, I'm pretty good with numbers, especially with a dollar sign. Yeah. And I told him, Sebastian, one thousand dollars will not do. Four thousand will. Our administration, and then I decided I want to do it. And administration said it was good. They supported me, but said, you know what? Let's play it safe. Seven thousand. <laughs> this is that's for a degree that in public university costs forty thousand, and in private university costs seventy thousand. Yeah. So it gets me. So it's uh, the uh, price. Just one thing. Uh, so I think you are coming sometime too close uh, to the camera. Yeah, that's, that's better. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So it's between one six and one tenth of the price that caused an earthquake. Sebastian and I were on the cover of on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, there, somebody called Jim Gates, who is perhaps the best physicist, black physicist in the world. Who is, who is a winner of the Presidential Medal, who was a member of, of PICAS, Presidential uh, Committee on Science and, and, and Advising Obama uh, and Technology, uh, asked whether Sebastian and I are the right brothers. And I said, no, 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 we are the wrong brothers. Uh, uh, why? Not because we invented the airplane, but whether we will find out if MOOCs will, will fly. And they did fly. So, so then we decided, then I went, I, don't, I, want, I have a one hour talk. We'll put some, uh, maybe some links to my talk at Princeton and, and, and uh, at Harvard. The first one on the web. Uh, 10, of, 10 of my talks are on the web. I gave 95 talks in 16 countries. There are still about 10 coming, including Singapore, which will be the 17th country. Uh, so we'll put two of them on the web. They're not up to date. The numbers are not up to date, but uh, 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 they're very funny introductions if people want to, to watch the first five, five minutes. So I decided I wanted to do it, but in the spirit of what we discussed, called them, uh, what we discussed before, in Hebrew words, uh, sprung, sprinkled in, I apologize. Uh, with the spirit of what I discussed before, uh, I'm only the dean, you know, I want to do it. So I created a, a faculty committee, I created a process. It took eight months to, to get it approved and we decided to do it and we started to do it uh, in uh, January of 2014. We, and we had 380 students. Actually, we, we could have 700 students, but we decided to start small to make sure that all the systems were running. You know, we, we, we didn't know, you know. Uh, so, so that's what it started. I can tell you later where is it now, which is unbelievable. Yeah, I think that would be good. So I think, uh, what, what was the trajectory there? So I think you started, so how many like people at the beginning? That was a master program. 380. Right? 380. It's and it was for master. So and, it was a two-year program? And the distinguishing part, there were online programs before. Two, uh, two things. One, they were ch uh, the university were charging the full, full price, not 10 times more than we did. Plus, actually, 11 times because we added for online, they added extra. <laughs> I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, these are like this. Uh, I think uh, Hawaii uh, University, the quality, this one. the quality of the courses and the program. We committed that the degree will be the same, no mm -hmm. discounts, and the quality of the courses are the same. The courses took a full semester to prepare, and the they cost 30 or 40,000 for people, dollars. Each car, each course. Each course. And we, we were lucky. I told you I'm good beggar. I and Sebastian went to the CEO of AT&T. His name was, he's not CEO anymore, Randall Stevenson. And he gave us two, $2 million. Yeah, and that's, and I think later, I... he gave me another $2 million. As a result, the prog, all the beginning, the startup cost, we would, it would be much, much slower without it. And maybe the naysayers would win, you know? 
if, if it was slower, it was more difficult, but with $4 million funding, uh, uh, this caused it to be up and running very quickly. And we owe a lot to at and And they got nothing for it. They, uh, we didn't treat uh, the candidates to students. We, did, we treated the same. Though initially they sent us many, a big part of the students. Eventually, uh, many others joined. So they're not the biggest anymore. Uh, yeah, actually, he was a uh, CEO at the time that I was at at and Research Lab. So I uh, remember his time there. And that's interesting because actually at at and we had some kind of online courses that we need to take. That is like maybe 2011, 2012. I think maybe that was the idea. That was the typical. I think probably that was the reason that... But this, the that definition maybe... was, it was for a degree. No, not certificate. And not that, certificate. Was, that was the first. That was... And it's called MOOC based, but it's really a little misleading because the courses are not MOOCs. Massive, they are big. We now have a, we have a deep learning course with 2,000 students, a course with 2,000 students, and several others with more than 1,000 students. They are a, a massive. So, massive uh, MOOCs had, uh, MOOC had 150,000 students except that only single digit percentage finished. <laughs> when you don't pay tuition, even symbolical tuition, uh, you're not serious. You have one difficulty. Your child is sick. There's a problem in work. You drop the course. So only 7% finished. So, so uh, how much is the fee now? Is it still 7,000 or uh, 4,000? Actually, amazingly, it went down. No, down. So by, by the way, <laughs> I'll get to the other, we had followers. We, we had many followers. We, had, we were the first. Uh, the fee course. went down. It was 7,000 or so. But then Georgia Tech eliminate 7,000 composed of the tuition and then there are fees. Georgia Tech canceled one of the fees. So the result, a, it's a little misleading. 7,000 is if you take two courses every term, because, because every term has its fees. Yes. Uh, if you took one course a term, it's 8,000. If, if, if you took a, a three courses a term, it's 6,000. Now, by canceling the fee, if you take two courses a term, it's 6,000. It was seven something, now, now it's 6,100. Now it's cheaper. It didn't go up. That's I'm great, you know. I mean, from 2013 to now, consider inflation and it went down. That's actually a, a uh, great. Yes. Uh, and uh, then how many people are now there? Do we have okay? Uh, so I'll bombard you with some large numbers. You know, the law of the large numbers. Uh, right now, 12,000 students in the last two semesters. Well, we might have peaked, it's not clear. Uh, I thought we peaked in 2000. 19, but then the pandemic brought us many more students. Many more students. Yeah, I think that makes sense because at that time, at the, during the pandemic time, I mean, they were considering, okay, anyhow, it would be online course. So <laughs> why should I pay a I don't and know, quality, 10 more times? And many universities moved to online and did a lousy job. Exactly. So it's not an easy thing to uh, do online. So, and do uh, We still went, uh, kept going up. It might be now, we, the two, last semester is 12,000, and this one may be 12,000 also. Uh, we don't know yet. It's too early. Just started the, the, the spring term. Uh, so 12,000 students. So far, we had 8,600 plus alumni. And this is, I want to emphasize, computer science in 2017, it, there were 700,000 unfilled computing jobs in the market. And they predicted it will pass a million in five years, which is 2022. Now we know that the pandemic, the, the, uh, we, we heard about layoffs. So th there are less jobs, but still there are many, many more jobs needed that, that, that can be filled. And, every, and this million, if, if we dip below a million, it will uh, surpass a million in the next year or so. So there are, this is an, a, a, it's a profession that dies for, 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 for trained the professionals. Uh, 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 and we had 8,600 uh, uh, graduates so far, 2,200 in the year 2022. In the year 2,200, 
which is more than 10% than it's of, of all the master graduates in the, in the States. So uh, still, uh, Georgia Tech has still the largest one, correct? Uh, yeah, uh, right now, uh, so first, I'll talk to the, the followers in the, in the moment. We had 1,300 stories about us. Uh, so I mentioned the New York Times. There were 12 in the New York Times, 12 in Wall Street Journal. There was, I had 15 interviews. I, in 2021, a, a weekend interview by Wall Street Journal and a fantastic uh, article in Forbes. Mag Forbes. Uh, so uh, they, they're still interested. They're still writing about us. Uh, and we will celebrate, we'll have double celebration in the next year. In January of 2024, uh, OMS CS, OMS CS Online MS, Master in Science, in co CS, Computer Science. That's the name, OMS CS. In, two, in January 2014, OMS CS will be 10 years old. Also, during this year, we will pass the 10,000 graduates. <laughs> So we, we may have two different celebrations or one combined celebration. We haven't decided yet, but we have a lot to celebrate. And we were lucky. You know, we were a glitch, a little glitch here and there. We never touched wood. We never had a major problem. Everything flew very well. Uh, great. So actually, this is that's exactly the thing. Like edicts, I don't like there were others like edicts, but still, I think Georgia Tech is still has the big no, name. No, no, because this is a, this is a degree. They are doing a lot of MOOCs, and our courses are not MOOCs. They are, they are not massive. They are not open. You pay tuition. They are online in their courses, but the first MO, they're not MOOCs. Uh, but but the MOOCs was the inspiration. The MOOCs, we saw the MOOCs were being done and Sebastian and I, our vision was uh, to take it to the level of degree, you know, to, to give credentials because that's what students want. And that's when the students, when they pay something, they are much more serious. They are committed, you know, uh, much more committed. So, uh, and we, we have much more survival rate. Okay, I can go into the survival rate if you wish. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, I think we can discuss that one. But also, I want to say, I mean, one other interesting thing about MOOCs is essentially there are challenges. I think you can talk about some of these challenges. In particular, I think one that I learned from you, I think this was the way that when the people are taking the exam, there is uh, like there are some people who are from the video of that, actually, this they are looking at them such that they can. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll explain. Everybody asks me. That's, that's a question, I, I told you, I gave the question uh, that talked 95 times. In half of the cases, they asked me about this. Uh, how do we prevent cheating? So here is my answer about cheating. First, everyone and everywhere, people can cheat and they do cheat. <laughs> Examine class with some staff, looking at them, they can still cheat. In computer science, we have less of a worry. If they cheat, they get a good job. After a little bit, they're fired if they don't know the stuff. <laughs> However, we don't want cheating because that will hurt our uh, brand. Reputation. Uh, we, we, cannot, we don't want us to get a name that, that everybody cheats in our courses. Uh, there is in online a way to do it still subject to improvement so i'm not sure it's not perfect and it's but there there, there is a proctoring company that's one of the expenses of, of of giving the course online and they proctor the exam somebody sits somewhere and you when you take the exam put the camera on it and say you're not allowed to take a book they can see that you don't take a book they can see that there is nobody that you're talking about to. And, they, and you don't know when they look at you. They, they look at 30 people. So that's part of the expense. I think that's a very important one, actually. Uh, so uh, nice one, yeah. uh, another challenge which we were lucky to overcome uh, is TAs. <laughs> On campus, we have one TA for every 50 student, uh, 25 students. A online one per 50. But still, if you do the numbers, 
you need almost 500 TAs. Exactly. Where will you get them? Uh, so first, this allowed us to grow our master program. So we'll have more TAs because they are funded as being TAs, you know? Yeah, and you can have more graduate students potentially coming. Yeah, yeah. The, so, the and, and, and because they usually, the on campus, we didn't accept some good students. That's the idea of the online. What, what we did at Georgia Tech was it took all the notion of selectivity upside down. Uh, selectivity, you know, every university is proud. Colombia was proud. We accept 7% of the candidates. Yeah. They, re they, they reject 40% excellent students. They don't, they don't say this. They accept only 7%. We are so desirable. We accept everybody that we believe can do the work. And we have some requirement that I can tell you a little more. So, so you mean these so are the regular have students? 12,000 students, which means a student in the average take 1.3 course. So it's 15,000 course student. Uh, we need you divided by 50, uh, you know, whatever. You, you do the math. Uh, we need the uh, 450 TAs. What saved us? Students of OMSCS and alumni of OMSCS volunteer to TA. We couldn't do them without them. They're partners. They love us. That's the sign. They work full time jobs. They, they earn real salary. Here as TAs, they even don't have tuition to get exemption. You know, the whole campus will get tuition. It's a lot of money. They don't get tuition, they get some small amount. They, they don't do it for the money. And so without, sense, them, yeah. without them, we couldn't do it. So in some sense, this is some kind of, I will say, network effect. Like, if I have, I, if I got my degree from this, I mean, like Georgia Tech online, I want to say that my degree was good. So I think I have motivation later on. Yes, can come yes, and help yes they, are, they are partners. They are partners. They, uh, it's self-sustaining. Uh, and then we had initially, we had concerns. Uh, where will you get the TAs? But uh, actually, we have more volunteers than we have uh, uh, space for them. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I mean, uh, currently, this is still, I mean, the partner of, uh, partnership of Georgia Tech and Udacity, correct? Uh, no, in 2019, uh, the beginning, we needed them. We did, we, you know, we could probably did, do it ourselves, but they were with the MOOCs, they had the experience, the experience, the building the courses, you know, there is a course designer, the staff, yeah, exactly. it, it's very expensive. It's not like the, or, or, the online, the still university do and, and charge full tuition, they just record the class. The, yeah. This is not the course, our courses. This is not. The, uh, the courses are broken into pieces. And every piece followed by certain questions is to make sure that students understand the notions. The notions. So, so it's, it's a much more sophisticated version of the class than simply a, taping a class. And you are now handling a Georgia Tech yourself, right? You have the software, et cetera, now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have everything. And the relationship was excellent. And since then, we are, we are doing it ourselves. Great. And no and, effect. Uh, that, that will save, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, great. So, yeah. So, I think that was a very... Well, uh, asked about followers. The first follower was uh, UIUC, University of Illinois, Urbana, Champaign. A guy called Rajat Chamandi was associate dean. He came to Georgia Tech to learn everything. And he created... I MBA, little I capital MBA, like iPhone, I MBA, yeah. <laughs> uh, which was very successful afterwards. His career took off. He became Dean of Business. He was associate dean in, in, in Champaign and Urbana. Yeah. He was Dean of uh, Business in Northeastern and now he's president of the Illinois Institute of Technology. His career took off. Yeah. Uh, and IMBA is the third largest. OMSCS is the largest, 12,000. We, both Illinois and us, have two more programs. 
One of them in Georgia Tech is analytics. It has 40, is at 5,400. IMBA has 4,200. They're the third largest. Uh, and yeah, sorry, what was are, the second? What, what was the second? Uh, in Georgia Tech, analytics, OMS analytics, in analytics, OMS. which is like data science essentially. Uh, and, and we have another one in cybersecurity. Uh, Illinois has also street. We, there is a, some a group that calls Class Central that does research and publishes this newsletter. And they, 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 they say about the sizes, but they also say that more than 30 university followed in our footsteps with more than 70 uh, courses. With, uh, I'm sure, 70 programs. And by the way, we are now have over 50 courses in our program. Actually, if you count courses that they can take from the other programs in Georgia Tech, because we have three programs, more than 60 pro courses in OMSCs. So, the, yeah, that's much richer than any master program anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, uh, are there other followers other than these three things? In we have three uh, three program in Georgia Tech, and they have three in Illinois. Illinois. Some other university has couple, you know. Uh, by the way, all of them are more expensive than Georgia Tech. Uh, only one that is at uh, ten thousand, which is, is UT Austin. They they are the other ones. IMBA costs twenty two thousand dollars, but it's still you know business degree costs one hundred or one hundred fifty thousand. So. So uh, it's still much, much more affordable. I think you are using economy of scale here as well, because you yes. have so many people, then you can figure it. So the question is that what is the future? I think that's the important one as a, like a visionary person that you created such a big program that still it is the biggest so, program. So first, our thing. followers showed that we actually led the revolution. It, it's now in a big scale. In a moment, I'll explain to you, it did not cannibalize the own, the own campus, what you were afraid of. It did not, did not cannibalize. Uh, right now, we, are, we moved a little bit. We are moving into undergraduates. Now, I, in the general case, I don't like the idea of a uh, bachelor degree or totally online. Uh, because college has other roles, you know, growing up, moving out, uh, uh, so, you know, social relationship and, and, and with other kids. Uh, I'm not for having a replaced college with own life, but, uh, but, but I am for doing part of it. Intro and we had the, the first introductory course, uh, which is the introduction to computing with Python. Uh, uh, we have an online course since 2017. And every semester we have over 500 students, half of them take this course online. Uh, we didn't yet move to reducing tuition, but, but usually with this financial aid, it's complicated for, 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 for college. Uh, uh, but we added two more introductory courses. So they have three courses. And, and basically my, my vision, my hope, my wishful thinking is that students can take online courses in several parts of the undergraduate. First, the introductory course. They can took it in high school or immediately after high school and still be at home and, and have a job. Then in the middle, when they take internship or co-op, they can take a course online. And then at the end, many senior level courses are the same as master courses in many universities. So they can go and have a job and finish like in, in master courses. And as a result, they can reduce the number of courses maybe by a third. And as a result, their tuition will, will, will be reduced by a third. And you ask if, if university choose to give a lower tuition for the online courses. It hasn't been done yet. Yeah, this has You been will been ask, done. why would they do it? They will lose money. No, they will not lose money. They will be able to accept more students because many of them will be out of campus. Now, yeah. in addition to these, to the undergraduates, there is high schools. So already several high schools, including some uh, charter schools, 
the Success Academy uses a, a couple of undergraduate course in, in they, they use it, high school. Uh, also to use it for lifelong learning. Uh, or for minor in computer science. Yeah. So these are essentially lots of other opportunities that uh, arises out of these uh, uh, things. Like I, I have actually done this. I mean, last past semester, I have all my classes were Zoom. The the students had the option to come to the class or they just join. Yeah, over me Google. too. I'm I'm teaching now because I sat yeah. down as dean in 2019, and uh, about half of or even more uh, of the of my class uh, watches it online. Yeah. So that's actually uh, because we we record in that. In the pandemic, we recorded the class, not now, but it's the same class. Yeah, and I actually, I'm just providing, I mean, they can join online when I'm teaching it. And I, so I record it such that later they can use it essentially. I think they loved it. And great, I think, gift that pandemic somehow gave to us that we tried lots of online solutions. And then, because before it was a bit hard for me to think about it, because there was a university the the way that they captured the board, it was not perfect. My voice was but not my perfect. My idea but... is that it said maybe up to 40% of the courses as a result about the tuition, the cost of college will be down by, by a third. Will not solve the problem. It's still very hard. But it will make it more accessible. Uh, in computer science, it's even better because if before and after they take a job, they make money while they're, they're studying. So, so it's even better than just saving the tuition because they have an income. They have income, exactly. Uh, and uh, let me add like uh, about how do we see that it didn't cannibalize? Uh, because the, the, uh, the two uh, populations are very different. A normal master's, on-campus on master's student, they are usually started at the age of 22 immediately after college. OMSCS master's student, uh, they, they started at 31. So they're older. That's one indication. Second indication, OMSCS is 60, 63, 40, 37, but they were around. On campus, it's mostly foreigners, 67 foreigners, 63, foreigners, 37, the domestic. OMSC is the other way around. The majority is domestic. And, 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 and the, 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 the 37 percent are, are uh, international, mostly Chinese and Indian. Who's the some other rivers? Uh, and uh, yeah, one other um, question that I had so I just got that. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. One other thing that the people say that essentially you may have less, like one of the reasons, for example, go to MBA is that you can actually interact with the people, with the professor, the professor, and get essentially like uh, more, because these relations, I mean, uh, this networking so I, is the one that helps you a lot. You know, I, I don't have time to give you the full talk that I give, which is an hour. Actually, at Stanford, I gave two, the first two were, were at Stanford, one to the faculty and one to the board in 2013 or 14, when we started. Uh, uh, but uh, how do you, just I think the last one is that question, uh, how do you replace networking here? Uh, uh, we have a phenomenon that they work much more with social media, our students. So, uh, on-campus students for relationship don't need social media, maybe just tell it for friendship, for love yes. and friendships and whatever. Yeah. Our online students, they interact also for, for the course. And they have, they have 70 groups by gender, by, by, by course, and they interact a lot. And we try to facilitate this interaction because we think this networking is important. So again, like with tests, you know, it, it's better to have it uh, face to face or, or uh, interaction and networking, better to have it face to face. But the, the, approximate, the online version is not as bad, it, it's close. 
And what about instructors? Because they may not be that much in social media. And if I want to get a recom letter, office hours. They have piazza. They have other. They have other uh, mechanism where the professor is present to questions and answers, etc. And uh, for example, does a professor write recom letters for so, some undergrad who took the or like uh, some, uh, but it's difficult. It's difficult. That's not exactly uh, the part uh, that we find ways, but uh, no, I don't think a thousand thousand students ask for letters. But then we we can have a, we can have a, the facu- some of the faculty. You know, they go to the faculty sometimes. Uh, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah, I think there are a lot we can discuss. Are there some of these uh, MOOC stuff that you gave? Are they available online as well on YouTube? Uh, all our courses are available as MOOCs, free of charge. No, no. So uh, if you no, don't I'm talking about that, free, ta- you can see the course. Uh, no, I'm talking about the invited talk that you gave about MOOCs. So I think yeah, yeah, we'll we'll put we'll put it we'll on put the web. Uh, we'll put the Princeton and the Harvard talk. Uh, Harvard from 2015 is the first one on the web, and 2019 in Springstone. Uh, both have a quite funny introduction, you know, uh, some funny stories there, but the first five minutes. But yeah, we'll put the link. Yeah, we will put the Maybe link on the YouTube so you can the come New York there. Times article, the couple articles uh, for, for everybody that is interested. Great. Yeah, so and the people, I mean, they, we got some question that I asked, or it was already answered essentially. If there are more questions, please ask at YouTube or LinkedIn. We will be happy to answer them. Uh, great. So I think uh, let's uh, go to this one. One quick thing I found to go before uh, research part is like you are also a part of the National Academy of Engineering and this uh, uh, American Academy of Science and Arts. So can you tell us a little bit about there? Like, the, I mean, what doing there? Have you done any administrative work there? And, What's, what do you do there, essentially? I think that's an important uh, one for people to know. So I haven't been that active there. So I, I have not done, an, I wasn't in any administrative capacity in these academies, but I do, two, I've done two things. One is I, sometimes they take me to some committees, so I, I take part. And some other times uh, I nominate, I nominate people to, uh, and actually I, I nominated dozens, but only few were admitted. It's very competitive, very difficult uh, to get people in. I, I got some, some, but uh, but uh, you, majority didn't get in. And sometimes you try several times. Uh, it's a lot of work and, and I'm trying to get my colleagues, some people that I appreciate. Uh, so, Several dozens are still in the pipeline, <laughs> but, yeah. but, but, but that's what I, I do. It's 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 difficult, and it's not you know like everything else. It's not perfect. Some excellent people never get in, uh, it, and some universities uh, like Stanford, and MIT, have many members, and it's some kind of an advantage. I, I don't blame them for anything, but but sometimes it's better that you're known by your colleagues. So. So, uh, 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 so some universities, uh, uh, and, and usually they might be better, so they get in more people. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm involved in trying to get not, not, only, not only to the academies, to prizes, to every, every other things that, that need nomination and, and letters of recommendation and this kind of thing. Uh, and do you meet like regularly uh, every month? Yes, OMS, CS, one, three, uh, I forgot their very long name. So they won three national prizes. First of all, uh, President Obama mentioned OMSCS twice. One of them, he came to Georgia Tech. Uh, OMSCS was featured in PBS uh, NewsHour. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, no, also one of the things that I want to ask about is, <laughs> This national academy. Are you a meeting every month or something like this? So how is it going? Like, are you giving recommendations? Uh, do you mean uh, meeting every month? With so I mean, is there a meeting or not? Such a things essentially in, in national academies. With whom? No, no. I mean, with, ah, with all the members. Yeah. Academies. No, no, no. They have annual meeting. They have. They meeting once a year. 
But there are some emails. And, and I, I went to some. I went. I, I skipped others. You know, the schedule doesn't always allow. It's kind of networking. There's some interesting stuff uh, going on, and it's and it's with lead, leaders in the field. So, so it's it's attractive to go there. Uh, great. So I think uh, now we will go. I think that these are not all uh, interesting things that you have done it, and we can I think talk forever. But I think uh, to <laughs> avoid to be. I mean, too long for this part. I think the research is another thing that we want to talk about is that you have done great research. You have been actually, I think, uh, for 13 years, uh, the editor-in-chief of uh, Journal of Algorithms. I'm happy, actually, that uh, I'm also now currently editor-in-chief of Algorithmic, or like two competing journal, I would say, at that time. And then uh, you have been also six years like the, man uh, like the uh, managing editor for SciComp, which is a very good journal as well. So, uh, and of course, the work of algorithm. So you want to talk a little bit about your research about algorithm, especially I think you work on graph theory and uh, like somehow a string problem. Both of them were super important part of algorithm design, tons of applications. And I think the others you have mentioned also complexity and others. So you want to start, I think, I don't know, with graphs or we can talk with a string. So, you want. so, yeah, uh, my research were in actually four areas. Uh, and all of them none, a little bit, complexity is my thesis a little bit, but uh, algorithms, complexity, cryptography, and uh, also experimental design, which is an area of statistics. I worked with somebody called Jack Kiefer, who was the founder of the field together with his advisor. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I worked with him several years, unfortunately he died very young. So, uh, but he was, a, he was a very prominent mem member of National Academy of Science and won all sorts of awards. So I, I was uh, uh, working with him too. But my main research area is algorithms and in it, Algorithms of strings and algorithms uh, on graphs. Uh, the algorithm of strings, I coined the term stringology, which means algorithms of strings. Yeah. Which now has a, a conf annual conference for the last 20 years. Uh, so you and also there is, a, there is a textbook by, by several of my friends that is called Jewels in Stringology. Um, so I can give you some examples. I can give you, but maybe I'll explain uh, the attraction to algorithms. Uh, 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 what, what is so attractive in research in algorithms? So actually three, three reasons. One, sometimes you can give, find the, the best algorithm possible, linear time, linear time, best algorithm possible. Some other times you improve the best algorithm, but it's not best possible, but it's like a world record. Linear time is world record. So you can have world records. And the third reason is sometimes, which is deeper, sometimes you discover algorithmic techniques. Algorithmic techniques that can be used to improve several algorithms in the same area. And I've done all of this. So we, we call I can, it give, I can give you examples from stigmatology and from graphs. Um, from stigmatology, actually, that's ex actually how I really got into algorithm. It's a funny story, okay? But first I have to explain that the two basic problems in stringology is string matching, it's, it's in every basic algorithm course. String matching and polynomial recognition. So what is string matching? String matching, you have two strings. It's a basic string matching problem. There are many more and more complicated and different ones. You have one string, it's a pattern. It's usually not that small, but not that large. For example, abracadabra. So you have a pattern abracadabra. And you have a much, much bigger text, like a Bible, a huge text. 
And you want to find in the Bible all the occurrences of the word Avakadam. How do you do it the most efficient way? So that's three matching. Uh, actually, the KMP Cruz Morris Pratt algorithm does it very, very well. It does it in linear time, actually in real time. What is real time? You get the symbols abracadabra one at a time, and then you get the Bible one symbol at a time, and you are allowed to spend only two, three steps in each symbol and to announce, is it the end of abracadabra? That's real time. So that's even better than linear time. Yeah, and, and I think it was using uh, some automata. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. So you need you use random access machine, which is like a computer, but I'll get to it in a second, a model of computation. Uh, and and Cruz Morris Pratt does it in real time on a random access machine. Uh, it has, however, two deficiencies. One, when the alphabet is large, the automaton, you, you create an automaton for the pattern a finite automaton, it's, it depends on the size of the alphabet. So it, when the alphabet is large, your automaton can explode. And the second one, you, you, you know how to do it, you knew how to do it in, uh, with random access machine. The question is, can you do it with a Turing machine without random access? The same question about palindromes now. Finding if a string, what is palindrome? Palindrome is a string that is read the same from left to right and from right to left. A man, a plane, a canal, Panama. Write it down. A man, a plane, a canal, Panama. Look from right to left, the same. If you ignore the spaces. Yeah, I think you can write, you can, the people can yeah, write. That's not a problem. It. You know, you get a string, you, you look uh, from, you look and, and compare this way. But the idea is you get one symbol at a time and you have to identify all initial palindromes. And it's too much time to check every, every suff a prefix because that's square, it's not even linear. So here's the story. I came for postdoc after to IBM, Yorktown Heights, and there was Albert Meyer who just got a few, a few months earlier an algorithm by a Russian. His name was Anatol Slisenko. That recognized all initial palindromes in real time by a Turing machine. Look totally unbelievable. How can a you, you need to check all the prefixes? A Turing machine doesn't have even random access. There was a minor or major problem. His paper was 172 pages. I think it still has the record, the longest journal pages, the longest computer science paper ever. And Albert Meyer gave him to one of his students, a new Russian, and he created a 510 pages, handwritten pages of this algorithm. And that's what he gave me. Oh. <laughs> and I read it. I got stuck in page 30 and did it myself. So that's how I got to kind of stringology. Then I went to string matching. And what I managed to do, and that's best, that's most possible from time complexity, you know, real time. String matching in real time for every alphabet on a Turing machine, not only on, 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 on random access, and the same for Turing machine, real time. So th this, this was, and that's the best possible. And then, the question was asked, and I did it together with Joel Cypheras, who was then in Rochester. What about space? Can you, because we uh, do you need linear space? And the answer is no, logarithmic space is enough. So, we, uh, which is the best possible. So in string matching and palindrome recognition, we, we have the best possible algorithm. So that's how I got. But how yeah. do we do it? Of course, I cannot explain. But I invented a condition, a, a, an algorithmic technique, which were used then for these two problems from others. How to convert algorithms that are not real time to real time. And uh, it's called the predictability condition, which was used several times to get real time algorithms when none was known before. Yeah, and I now, think 
with psychology later with student with students various students um, uh, we did uh, we have uh, about a dozen uh, algorithms which are best possible maybe can be improved but they are best possible uh, uh, to do swing matching in one dimension and multi-dimension exec or approximate uh, another version many many versions of swing matching uh, 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 parallel and sequential actually parallel together I had 17 students, one of them died at 48. His name was Danny Breslauer. With Danny Breslauer, we did parallel swing matching. And the question is, how fast can you can do it with linear work? Linear work, the work is linear means that every action of a processor is counted and it's linear. So if you have quadratic number of processors, you can do things in constant time. You can check everything at once. But the question is to do it in linear work, and did it, we did it in log log n time and proved that it is the best possible. And later, but, but this log log n time needs for the pre-processing was a pattern. And later, if the pre-processing was given with a bunch of people, I did it with randomized algorithm for constant, constant time, even better. But that's if the pre-processing is given. <laughs> but if, if a pre-processing is included, log log n time is possible and it's the best possible. So that was, me... that was a story about uh, stringology. Yeah. This... Uh, yeah, let me add a little bit, I mean, here, I mean, also a bit more context. So I think you mentioned some uh, important problem, the string matching and palindrome. These are two important things. In general, I think this uh, string, I mean, uh, problems are generally, there are two strings who texts are given to you and you want to see what is the, for example, another important one, which is the complement of a string matching is, uh, is uh, edit distance between these two things. That is very useful. For example, you may type something wrong and you want to find the closest things, which is uh, like closest to this. And there are some, uh, I mean, some variants of that also in the, like the people who are working. So we did, we, did, we did work with edit distance. I won't get into the details. And we actually invented an algorithm tool called sparse, sparse dynamic programming. A dynamic programming is a tool generally in optimization. When you want to optimize, it's a well-known from uh, operations research. Uh, and many like edit distance and variation because edit distance is one problem but there are many problems that have things like distance of, of strings uses dynamic programming. But the dynamic programming has quadratic number of uh, equations. And we found that only linear number of them are needed. So that's, this is a technique to use much smaller a number of recursions to solve the problem. And, and we sped up a number of uh, algorithms with this technique. Yeah, actually, I mean, this is, you know, that's the thing that you mentioned. So uh, this, when a PhD students come say, okay, these are like, for example, a string matching. These are the problems that, I mean, the people worked a lot, you know, <laughs> from a long time ago, the people have worked on it. So that was, I think like uh, something like about six, seven years ago that actually I get into more a string matching type of problems. So that was one interesting, important problem is that the, exactly the same problem that you mentioned. If you want to get, for example, the, essentially the distance between two strings, edit distance, dynamic programming is you need order n square. You may get it a little bit uh, by log better, maybe n square over log n or log n to the two or something like this, but really, Still, I think this is the big problem. Can you get n to the two minus epsilon? And I think that was a big open problem there that can you uh, solve, a, can you find a constant factor approximation in sublinear time? This was a, a, a subquadratic time. Actually, that was the thing that we started and we invented this concept of a triangle inequality that we have done it. I mean, we have done all the steps except one step that was in quantum. And then this, and there was another group that actually could change that quantum one also to the uh, regular things. And there actually we can get, for example, now we have a constant factor approximation for the problem in subquadratic time. These are, and this is, I want to say this is an example that like when I started, I was not sure that, I mean, with the students, we were actually break uh, students 
Thais Adirin. That we started this and said, whether we have any idea, this is some kind of old problems and the people tried a lot. Maybe we are not that expert. But this concept of triangle inequality that happens essentially and allowed some kinds of parallelization that actually became very useful. And that also has been extended later to this kind of new concept of parallel algorithm, which is called massively parallel computing. But uh, that's, I think that's a good uh, thing for the people that don't be afraid about this. I think you should try and you may get something that, again, yeah, the people worked on it, but still there might be something that you can reach there and others they have not reached there. And I think that's the important thing. And also I wanted to say the new applications of this, uh, like string matching, these are very important. For example, when you talk about the JSON or XML or HTML, these are the, this called, instead of edit distance, we have three edit distance. But these are also used a lot in lots of new databases like MongoDB or others. These are very useful even right now, these algorithms, both at the string version and the more three edit distance and variation like XML, JSON are still are in use and very basic concept of the computer science that we are using in all databases, etc. Now let's go to the networks and graphs essentially. I think that's another thing that you have done again Great work, essentially, about max flow matching and others. We want to discuss this one. Yeah. So uh, it started with max flow. Uh, uh, we our, uh, so we were, we gave an algorithm to max flow uh, of time bound m. Uh, m is number of edges. N is the number of vertices. Log square n. Uh, it has been improved several times. The first. The first one was Tarzan and Slator. That was with a student, Amon, Amnon Amman, uh, in the late 70s. Then a few, couple years or three years later, Tarzan and Slator invented splay trees, which is a wonderful data structure to cut one log. So as, again, I take all the credit because they wanted to improve our algorithm. They invented yeah. this data structure. Then all in, uh, improved twice the algorithm and ended up with NM. NM is now the best. It's the best strongly polynomial algorithm for, so I don't know if you know, big O notation. Big O notation forgets constants, okay? Tilde, big O tilde notation forgets logs. In the big O tilde notation, our algorithm is still the best because only two logs were chopped, but, but it's still log difference. So that was kind of the first one, algorithms is not a best anymore, but there are several other, uh, there are several other algorithms that we did in, I did in, with other uh, collaborators in the eighties, which are uh, still best. So still well record, nobody improved them in the last 30 years. One of them is weighted matching. One of them is trivalent graph isomorphism. Uh, one of them is tree matching. And there was a fourth one that I right now forget. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think uh, for uh, this one, uh, I, there was some recent, uh, so uh, I think one- oh, There were recent, <laughs> algo uh, as, uh, going back to string matching, uh, the, there is recent work by several authors uh, that have an almost linear algorithm for max flow, but it's not strongly polynomial. It has log of u. u is a maximal capacity. That means uh, strongly polynomial means that it treats every input as an element. Yeah. Uh, but then if the, if the capacity can be huge, uh, you, you have log, log of this capacity. So the, the new algorithms are, are not strongly polynomial. Uh, one uh, major defect in my humble opinion is the paper is over hundred pages. So they are competing. They're not gold medal for, for the longest paper because Slisenko is still the number one, but they are very close. And I don't believe in hundred page papers. Always, I mean, that's, that's there a should challenge, be some simplified it's a challenge to the community to find a much better way. I think the main open problem for Max Flow is still is to get the linear 
time algorithm linear in terms of number of vertices and the number yeah, of uh, edges. Yeah, that will be wonderful. And that is one on my desk. So, you know, I was out of research for, for 20 years as dean <laughs> and president, 25 years. And I, I'm back to the old problems. So I, uh, that's one of them. No, not linear, but MN is very far from linear. MN is quadratic. Or, or actually it's N cubed when M equal N square, you know? Yeah, it's uh, so the same for matching as well. I think the best one Matching, is the yeah. Uh, we, uh, uh, the fourth algorithm is together with Tarzan and others is uh, spanning trees. Then that's also the, uh, the best, uh, but it's again, since the 80s, it's not yeah. been improved. So I think this is like uh, some big <laughs> open problems are for maximum matching, so, uh, maximum flow. Basically the, these four problems that I mentioned uh, are open problems, do better. Plus, yeah. plus the one uh, that is the monster problem to get even similar time bound, but with a normal proof. Uh, and what about, I mean, in the stringology? Do you, ha do you have any- There are problems, problems? but I, I, it, it will be too technical to get into details. Yeah. yeah there are, uh, some of the other algorithms we did are not best possible. Uh, there might be better ones, but, uh, but you know, they haven't been improved. Yeah, yeah, I think that's like the one of the main, uh, like, like especially edit distance and longest common subsequences are some of the things that getting better approximate, like maybe a bit worse approximation, you may not get exact, but the yes, running yes. time will be left. These so are the, the direction that is very active. They are these versions, yes. Very active, so on, the people can think about it. Great. But I mean, one person actually asked about this. Uh, you mentioned that about the president. Uh, and uh, you have been president at Tel Aviv University, and I think you mentioned something you want to talk about it. I mean, if you want, you can mention that somebody asked about it, but yeah. Okay. Uh, this is again a long story, and it was in the media. Uh, I was pushed out. I, I uh, offended a board member because I didn't let him do negotiate. He was a real estate tycoon. And he wanted to negotiate with real estate people for a project for the university. And I saw it as a conflict of interest and he pledged to kick me out. And he succeeded after two years. When, he ha when, he, when they got a chairman of the board, a woman that was on his board, company board. So the two of them organized a, a coup. A, later, a 400 faculty wrote a letter to the, to the main newspaper uh, complaining and asking me because they were surprised. Uh, they didn't want me. They were on the board, chairman of the board, so I resigned. Uh, and two months later, I got called from Georgia Tech. And you had uh, a great success uh, with the MOOCs, essentially. Yes, OMS, yes, which is much bigger. So right now, I'm quite grateful to these idiots. Yeah. So, uh, and in Tel Aviv, even though I was president for two years and one month, I had two major achievements. First, I broke the record of fundraising. And it's still, I think, I didn't have a chance to verify, but I haven't heard about the bigger. It's still several times bigger than the next biggest list. This is at Tel Aviv University. Right? Yes. And the second one, I, since you mentioned Blavatnik, uh, Blavatnik named the, the School of Computer Science. Yes. So he gave me millions for this. So, and later, and I brought Blavatnik to Tel Aviv University, later supported many other things for bigger sums. So he's a, he's a huge, unbelievable, uh, he's one, you know, including in the League of Gates and others. He, he's a billionaire. So, yeah, he's, he's, he's there. Uh, and you uh, he gives, he supports the New York Academy of Science that, that has a Blavatnik Fellowship that you remember, yeah. Uh, yeah. and I was also in this year, in, in, in the, I wasn't in the selection committee this time, but uh, I, they have a, a gala uh, every year when they award it. So yeah. I was in the gala and, uh, and he was there. Uh, and he, he, he is an incredible, incredible donor. Yeah, actually, I checked uh, his things yesterday, beloved. He had actually Len beloved because they're brothers as well. No, Len. Uh, he, he has a 35 billion. I think he had it 50, no, no, actually, no, uh, but the market went down. You can go to the Forbes list of the billionaires. 
So yeah, I'm not exactly. sure he, what his number in the world uh, recently, maybe 40. I, I don't know. I think he, I mean, yesterday it was 35 billion that they changed. No, no, but the number, number in the world, you know. Uh, yeah, I think that is top. I think probably, I think it's 50. like top 30, 40. Yeah, yeah, 30, yeah, 40 yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, he, is that, a, he is an incredible donor and unbelievable. Yeah, and I, think I, I think had a, the pleasure and honor to, to meet him and to get his help in more than one uh, occasion. I, 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 so, so these two things I did in Tel Aviv, the, big, the biggest gift was not from him. It was somebody from, from uh, the board, but, uh, but Blavatnik named the, the, the School of Computer Science is named after Blavatnik, but also the Center of Cybersecurity in Tel Aviv University is named after Blavatnik. Yeah, actually, I mean, I, I mean, great. I mean, for me also, I should say, as like a Blavatnik honor, it's like so. You, 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 got, you got the Blavatnik fellowship. They, I mean, this is the honorary. I mean, they give it to one person, but they have honorary things that they, oh, have, right, they right, are right. selecting essentially. Yeah, the, uh, I don't know, the seven, eight people essentially in that area. And I think one of the interesting things I was not so sure whether I want to go to that party or not. I mean, but like in the pandemic still. And but I'm very glad that, of course, I met you there. But there were other quite interesting. I think President of Harvard was the person who was <laughs> announcing the things. Yeah, but, it was quite I, amazing to I, me, yeah. I think he's stepping or stepped down already, but Bako, Bako, he, yeah. he was there, he spoke. Uh, yeah. yeah, I like yeah, him it was a lot. I like, awesome. I like him a lot. I don't know the news president, but I, li I liked him a lot. Yeah, that was a great thing. Uh, good. So I think, let me see what uh, else I think we want to... Yeah, so I think you want to talk a, a little bit also about, I mean, the... Uh, I think, uh, thank you part, and maybe I think that was the joke that we can... But, uh, Julie, you gave it to me that uh, I think maybe the other people should thank you. I think lots of people that you work with them, they got Turing Award, they got Nobel Prize. So I think you should work with them <laughs> like the newest students. They, you will get the essentially a top award. But anyhow, so I think you want to talk about the people that you want to thank you or they should thank you. And also, I think we didn't talk about PhD students. So you had actually, I think, a great number of PhD students. I think 17 I graduated. Had 17 and had but, I been faculty, uh, you know, it's only in, my, in the first 20 years as PhD. Afterwards, I didn't have, PhD, uh, I couldn't uh, conscientiously take a PhD student after I became dean. So they're all, I, I, I've had, Hey, hey, I had fantastic students and I'll, I'll be bad and I'll mention only a few of those. So uh, uh, basically having a PhD student is one of the best things uh, of being a professor. Uh, if they're like in my family, or almost, they're not my, like my son, but, but they're, they're a very close relationship. Very I close relationship. Very closely with them. I suggested to them problems. They came to talk to me, lots of interaction. They created the community. So I mentioned four of them. One is Moti Young, and he is kind of one of the top, maybe the top cryptographer in Google. He, he has done some, uh, some excellent work in cryptography. The second one, also in cryptography, is actually famous because he's, he's a co-inventor of blockchain. His name is Stuart Haber. And there are two fantastic people in algorithm, David Epstein. Uh, David Epstein is in UC Davis, and uh, Pino Italiano in the University of Rome. So, uh, so they, and they, some of the works that I mentioned before are, are with, with, this, with, with these two. Uh, and, and we are still in touch, I mean, still in touch is more than half in 10, 10 of the 17, we just have dinner here and dinner there, unbelievable. So uh, this is a real pleasure, a real privilege uh, to have these students, to have them very close, uh, and, and, and continue the interaction with them. And uh, it's a real pleasure to see them succeed. Yeah, actually, as you mentioned, I mean, these are like PhD students are like your son. So you want to actually see that they are successful. And actually, uh, one other thing, I think, for the people... And, and, and as you say, as you say, you know, uh, uh, Auman won the, no, uh, the Nobel Prize, Pluelin won Turing, uh, Hopkins won Turing, Hatmanis won Turing, and Kiefer won uh, many equivalent ones in statistics. So all five uh, uh, were, were giants. So, yeah. uh, uh, and they were nice and treated the midget, me, uh, very nicely as equal. 
so uh, very nice. They all treated Hopwood was uh, intimidated, but it was me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I uh, mentioned uh, that uh, already, yeah. And in sense, uh, I was extremely lucky. And, and actually, when uh, we mentioned it in our discussion, the notion of luck came into play. And I made the list. I consider myself one of the luckiest person on earth. Uh, even with what happened in Tel Aviv. In Tel Aviv, they pushed me out. I was president for two years and one month. They managed to push me out. Well, come on, I mean, you became and essentially the head. Anything yeah. wrong. But so I made the list and each time I look at the list, I add an item. Right now it has nine items. So I go over quickly. Sure. First of all, I was born in 1947. And as a Jew, it was luck that I didn't, wasn't born 10 or 20 years earlier in Europe. You know why? Yeah. <laughs> um, during my lifetime, the world was in relative peace, okay? So after two world wars, you know, there was no world war, there was Soviet Union, but didn't do, did the mini bad things, but nothing happened. So, uh, so, so far, so good. I mean, the, yeah, we have the Ukraine war and other, yeah, like, you know, we had others, we had Rwanda, we had other things, but, but, but there was no world war. World war, yeah. Uh, in Israel, there were two wars, but the, and I was in two wars. I was uh, I was fought in two wars, but they were small, and I survived. So that's luck, luck number three. L luck number four is the five, five people I mentioned, the giants. I had the fortune uh, to 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 be to, to be in the shadow and and to study for them and to work with them. War. Luck number five, how I got into Cornell when it was essentially my only option. Yuri Sartmanis had the credit. And in the talk that you'll get the link to, the talk was named Yuri is my super mentor and my super supporter. Without him, I wouldn't get into Cornell. And I wouldn't get into American universities that year. So and it tells the story. Didn't have time. Luck number six is computer science, a new fresh field with lots of open problems, with lots of things to do. You know, that's why, you know, in mathematics, as I said, many problems, people worked for them for, for decades, for centuries. Here, the, the field was born in the 60s. Uh, I lost count, of, I think it's luck number seven, my PhD students. I am privileged to have had them. Luck number eight, that after I fell from grace, uh, I woke up from the mattress and did OMSCS in Georgia Tech. Uh, and luckily, you know, when you do something new, when you do something with techno technology, lots of things can go wrong. Only minor glitches so far. Very lucky, it, it, it's a huge success. And the last one is my family. And I mentioned my family. And maybe I'll tell you a funny story because uh, the most important person here is my wife. Uh, she was tremendous to my career. She didn't give me career advice. She's not strong in math. She cannot prove any theorem. But she was tremendous by giving me people advice, you know, uh, administration advice. Uh, and uh, everything in life is luck, as, as, as all of you know. And I met her for, she was going to biology, I was going to mathematics, why wouldn't we meet? So Tel Aviv University had the language requirement. And the language was English. But if you got 80 from 100 in matriculation, uh, you got exempt. Both of us got 80. Both of us could be exempt. But I don't know if you remember, you, you should be old enough to remember the time where children listened to their parents. Yeah. And that was very long ago. Yeah. My son never listened to me. You know, he, he, he sometimes asks my advice, but usually he doesn't need my advice. Yeah. So, but there, there were times, her, my father told me, you know what? 
take the course anyway. You're, everybody that got less than 80 had to take a course. He tell me, take the course anyway. Her father said, take the course anyway. That's how we met. And That's why my English never improved. Uh, yep. I think that was, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> great. Uh, uh, things so uh, like uh, yeah one thing I want to say actually for the people also I mean for us as we mentioned these are like the students or like the or sons this, this website is a very nice one it is math genealogy that's actually very interesting if you go there I mean if you search any person in the math or computer science essentially and you will search the people there you can see the students the advisors and then you can see I mean who was the great scientist that was my grand grandpa and who are my descendants? Actually, I think you had it, something like a great numbers, like 150, 160 actually descendants already. That these are all. Yeah, like, I don't, know, I don't know many. Grandchildren, I don't know many essentially. Of them. I don't know many of them. Yeah, but I mean, still, uh, I think that's uh, great for them to have you there. So, oh, uh, one actually one person asked this question. So, uh, have you, how about like the? Uh, did you like interact? <laughs> like uh, interact with machine learning people? Have you considered? on any machine learning and how was uh, hot because you have seen the whole things. So I'll tell you, I became Dean in 95. That's when I lowered my research from to zero. Machine learning was in its infancy. In, so I, I didn't do research in machine learning at all or in deep learning on machine learning. When I was dean, I already in the year 2000 realized that machine learning becomes a very important part of computer science. And I hired that, the guy that now is the late, David Waltz, to create a machine learning center at Columbia. And he created a wonderful machine learning center at Columbia. I Sorry, who was the name? David Waltz, w, he, he died 10 years ago. Uh, at that time, I told everybody that machine learning is the calculus of computer science. So, and I believe so. It's, it's so central now. You ask OMSCS students, what do they want to do next? Half of them say machine learning. Everybody wants to do machine learning. So it's central. I didn't do research and, and, and I didn't do now, you know. Though I know some statistics and the probability, I could probably do something, but but I, I'm still with the old classical problems. Good. One other question actually I saw that also they mentioned, I mean, like, uh, uh, like Daphne that you mentioned or Andrew, they actually took their online courses. They even they went out of the faculty at Stanford and they have this company. So you had a successful... Also, uh, Seba also Sebastian, yeah. Yeah, and all of these guys essentially decided to go and they have their own company, essentially. It was very successful. You had a very successful story very uh, early on. I think being a professor is the best job in the world. That's why, uh, you know, you asked me why, if I wanted to be a professor, I, I didn't decide when I was a kid. Uh, I saw my father love, love his, loves science, love research. Uh, so it, you ask how many hours you work. These hours sometimes frustrating, you know, but in many cases it's fun. Uh, you love what you do. So plus the graduate students. So I, I think being a professor is the job in, best job in the world. I was in industry. I was in a, a, a IBM, a Yorktown in Almaden. I was in Bel Air. I was in Belcordia. I and I did research, but this was usually the academic research that they did in the slabs. So I'm not a practical guy. Uh, it might have occurred, uh, and I never got into a startup. I, it, it didn't happen. I don't miss it. I, I appreciate and value people that do it. It's important. Uh, it's important in our field to, to, to spring so many startups and so many companies in the millions, in the billions, eventually in the trillions. Uh, but uh, and it's important that he's done, and I have friends that did it. I I I I don't have such a claim to make. 
Yeah, because I think that that was exactly the question that you already answered. That I mean, this was a successful one. You could actually make a startup out of it. That, but I think it, it is completely right. The thing that you mentioned, I completely felt this. I have been quite a bit actually at industry, but it is they are very good because you see the new technology. But always good to come back and try to go deeper, not and not be superficial. Actually, go in deep and understand it, and you can make much more better contribution in academia because there is no force that you need to sue. These things for the next quarter or these things, you have a much better, uh, I mean, freedom in some sense here. You, not that much money nowadays, maybe. <laughs> yeah, the, I think the money probably is the main. It's, no, no. Uh, so cool. being a professor, you you make a decent salary. You don't starve. You live comfortably. You don't make, a, even now, a, academicians in industry, Google, Facebook, uh, uh, Amazon, they may make uh, new employees. They are just hired after PhD, can get salary higher than full professor. Yes, exactly. Salary in industry, which attracts many, many of the young uh, uh, PhDs, uh, even if they have academic opportunities, sometimes the money attracts them. Yeah, for, that's exactly. For me, yeah. for me, the money was important, but never the most important. Uh, uh, great. Now, I think we want to go to uh, like the, like uh, some kind of the anything that you want to say to high school students or college. I think you like you already started to mention the computer yes, science activities. Yes, so maybe some advice uh, from the wise, supposedly wise. Uh, first, and it's true for everybody, not only in our field. Go in the direction where you love what you do and you were a good way. Okay, this is the direction you, you should choose. I also told you university position is great. It's one of the greatest career. Uh, you won't be rich. You won't be very rich. You will be comfortable. You, if you're good, okay, you have to be good. And something specific to computer science. Computer science is the hottest field. In terms of jobs, I say that there are a million or so, maybe plus, maybe minus, computing, unfilled computing jobs in the industry. Um, so there is a huge, huge demand. Uh, that's for job-wise, okay? There was even when I told you that they will that five years ago in seven, 2017 they said there will be a million dollar uh, unfilled jobs. They also gave the following statistics, which I found amazing. They said that if you look five, and I'm not sure if it was checked, but they predicted five years from now, which means 2022, that of this. STEM jobs, science, technology, you know, STEM jobs. Yes. Mathematics, yeah. Yeah. 74% of them will be in computing. 16% in engineering, in all of engineering. So the need, and you see it in all university, computer science is exploding or exploding. That's what I say to all other universities. Computer science should be a college, not a department. Carnegie Mellon was the first in the 85. See where they are, they're tied for number one. Yes, in the university, the other departments are not in the top 20. In computer science, they're tied for number one. Yes, that's the one. I have been uh, there. Georgia Tech was tied number two. We are ranked in all degrees of computer science, top 10, five, six, seven, even though we don't have many superstars. I won't get into the details. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but we are a college yeah. and we are big and we cover a lot more. And we can accommodate even to us that can have many, many more students, we still have or no, not have room for everybody. The, the, the demand is unbelievable. And it's much, it's bigger than all of engineering. So I'm not sure it's four times like, like 16 to 74. 
but it's much more in computer science than all the seven, eight different departments together in engineering. So this is the hottest field. And also in OMSCS, we have many people, by the way, 8% have PhDs and take OMSCS. 20 something percent have master in other areas. And we, so OMSCS in addition trains multidisciplinary experts because people from outside computer science need a lot more than the basic uh, programming. They need a big piece of computer science and that's why you see them in OMSCS. So that's like the great advice. Uh, always go. And uh, one question as they mentioned that should we start with math and then go to CS or we should just start with CS? Like at the highest level. Uh, you should get some math courses and depending if you go to theory, you should get more. Uh, some and, and many CS program has have some mass uh, basic requirements, you know, general requirements. So uh, both are valid. People, uh, you know, when you're undergraduate, if you love mass, do mass, take some computer science courses, and then do a master in computer science. So uh, both options are valid. Uh, and you, no, can do you can do physics in other areas. You know, we, we accept everybody. Uh, the way we do accepting, we we, uh, we do accepting as, as follows. We a you it's a master program. You have to have a BA in something. So we don't if without BA we don't accept. Second, we don't require we, we require TOEFL. So you know English. We don't require GRE. But so not in computer science and not in other in other things. However, when you admitted, you're not admitted. You are provisionally admitted, conditionally admitted. You have to take two out of a list of 10 or 15 courses and get at least a B in each. Only if you did that, you are officially admitted. admitted. So what about retention? How many, are, how many that are starting? What percentage survive? So it depends, it depends who do you count? If you count also that they were conditionally admitted, 65%. 65%. But if you take only those that succeeded in the two courses and really were admitted, 85% finish. And let's compare to 7% finishing MOOCs. Yeah, I think it, as you mentioned that for online courses, especially retention is very important because that's one of the most important things that whether these people continue until the end or not. So uh, one of the questions that I actually was mentioned, so among computer science fields, any area like there are AI theory, like AI also contains machine learning, of course, programming languages, systems. Do you have any suggestion even there or? <laughs> will Everybody knows the, the hottest area is AI and machine learning. Deep learning. I think cyber security is hot as Cyber well. also, cyber also, cyber also. This yeah. is the hottest area. Theory was never hot, but theory attracts people strong in mathematics. So closer to mathematics. And the mathematics foundation of computer science is important. So, and they will still find jobs. You know, it's not much better than mathematicians. You know, I mean, I will say actually, I mean, some of my students say uh, they are we are working on the game theory, like algorithmic game theory. They found I will mention, I mean, this they may not get it that way, but this is like you know, these top companies, Google, Microsoft now, even Amazon and other, they are all Facebook, they all run based on advertisement. Advertisements are essentially auctions and game theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All my students that they have been there, actually they have got the very huge things because not too many people are working in the intersection of like algorithms and game theory. That's also an area that actually, they, there is a lot of needs there because they are also, somehow you have algorithm, but at the same time you have psychology that you try to understand like the, how these people think about it because you need to play a game with them. But uh, yeah, good. So any other things that we didn't cover and you want to cover? Uh, I think I covered about three times what I thought that we will cover. So I, yeah. I, I, I think we are fine. And I think we are over three hours, but I'm not sure. No, actually, I think uh, two, two hours, two hours and 15 minutes. 
Ah, uh, 12, 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah so that, that's good. Yeah, I think that was, uh, so it was a great, uh, I think, uh, like uh, that we had you in this uh, series. I mean, I the whole idea. You, I will send you some of these links that you yeah, post, we will uh, add one of them. And if I understand correctly, people who couldn't watch it still could go to YouTube and watch it. Yeah, this, I mean, the, the link that we have it, it is there. I mean, also at LinkedIn, at Twitter. Also, it will be on, uh, if you just, because that's one good thing that we just talk. We don't write anything. So they can actually uh, listen at podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. All of them, they can actually <laughs> listen that. All of them will be available. I will put it there like in a few hours. So everything will be available. I think that was a great thing, like a great experience from both administration and online courses that was somehow unique. And I think it was great that we had you there. And yeah, if there's nothing else, I think, uh, thank you again for- <laughs> Thank, thank you, time. I, yeah. I had fun. I, I, I love uh, talking about some of these things. Uh, you know, I, I'm still giving uh, talks about OMSCS. I never get bored. Yeah, but I think if we talk about even administration stuff and others, so hopefully the people also get some ideas on that things. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and those people who are joining in the future, and uh, they are watching us. Thanks, uh, Dewi, I tried my best to mention your first name and bye for now. Bye. bye.